and there we go. It's off to the cloud. Well, welcome everybody to week 11, maybe. If it's not week 11, well, it might as well be because this is a 13 week course. This, which means we have Allison coming in here to help us out figuring out the entire field for us and to make sense of it, you know, and who better, who better uh, to have as the person that will do just that and will help us understand HPT uh, and the research in corporate training uh, and organizations like ISPI and the eLearning Guild. She'll tell us about those. So you might want to sign up and become a member. This will be all part of the conversation today. It'll be extensive. It'll be wide ranging. It'll be hopefully thought provoking at times. And it'll get you to read additional information. It'll be a lead in. It'll also be a reflection back to our article, which was in week two. So we have someone coming in to talk about not that article from week two, but everything else. And that's what okay. this. I reread it today. Oh, you did? I'm okay. Ready to rock and roll. Great. Okay. So, you know, uh, I'm not going to ask you to lecture on it, but I will ask you to provide um, a, a sense of where maybe we can start with that. But Ellen, Ellen Wager gave me a, a question she told me I should start with. And she said, Okay. You should, I should have Allison talk about her dog before anything else. So, Allison, uh, it was right. one of my questions, anyways. And uh, oh as you know, I, I, I've sent you the questions. I want to make sure the, I get the name right. Um, Roxy. Got, uh, what's that? Roxy is, Roxy is my dog. Right. Uh, I hadn't refreshed it online, but, you know, you say, what, what can we learn from Grady Wagberry, who's Ellen Wagner's dog, was Ellen Wagner's dog. I love that dog. And then my, my cats. Uh, I think I have Gwyn and uh, one other one up there. Which one? I don't know. Maybe Raider. Uh, Shayna. 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 Yeah, Yiddish for beautiful. Uh, okay. What you can learn from those is you love them and then they leave you. That's what happens. I have to admit, I today I took a little trip down memory lane and I was reading some articles and looking at people I had quoted like... Uh, Patricia Smith and Tim. Tim's gone. I think Pat's gone too. Um, of course, Jay Cross. So yeah, one of the things you learn is you you wouldn't think it's possible, but it happens. But it happens. Yeah. So uh, that's probably not the cheeriest thing to start with, but the the cheeriest thing to start with would be Roxy. She's not in here with me now. She's a labradoodle, twenty eight pounds of love and joy um we had a <laughs> we had cats all our lives because i traveled all the time and my partner was a you know 75 hour a week working human so <laughs> we couldn't have a dog because we weren't wouldn't be responsible we could have a cat but it turned out my partner sue is allergic to cats so we wondered why oh she'd get a cold and she'd go to bed for three weeks with this horrible chest infection and of course it was because the cats and we have many pictures as soon as she get into the bed the cats would get on her chest and and they'd be happy but of course she just was sick for weeks on end so no more then the cats died then she realized oh my god i feel so good no more chest con congestion and so we wound up with a dog a labradoodle a hypoallergenic very sweet, well-behaved pooch. Yeah, my and son has one of those too. Uh, I have a cockapoo. I'm cockapoo's. insanely fond of it. Her, insanely fond of her. Yeah, I have a cockapoo, and his name's Oliver, and he's gone running with me. I've run 591 days in a row, and he's gone most days. Um, so That's I'm good. trying to get to 600. That's great. I'll try, I'll try to get to two years, which is 730. I don't know if I'll make it. My knees tell me I can't, but I'm going to try. So, um, so yeah, our animals, so everyone wants to see my animal. They want to see Oliver and Facebook, posting Facebook every day. I have Dalai Lama like quotes I post every well, day to Facebook and I'm turning it into a daily calendar. What? Look me up on Facebook and you'll see our Labradoodle wearing for Halloween, her shark fin. Aha. Uh -huh. well, I like it. Looking yeah. good. Yeah, I like that. So everyone's gonna friend you now after this session. It's so, 
Yeah. Okay. No, so, sir. Kevin, you know, I, I, actually, let me do this. So, I've asked Ellen's question. Instead of starting with my questions, let's see if anyone here who people have shown up, um, about a third of the class, more than a third has shown up here. Does anyone have an opening question to ask of Allison instead of my questions? I want to jump in here. Kevin's usually got a question. I know Kevin can jump in anytime, and, and Rebecca always has a question. Mark is going to ask one. Mark. Hi, uh, My name is Mark Tatera. Um, kind of new to this HPT field, um, and uh, that's going to be my main focus once I get my uh, degree here. Um, so kind of curious, uh, what is your best advice for uh, somebody who's just starting off into the, the HPT field? Mm -hmm. Get really good at analysis. Uh, be able to tell a pile of this from a pile of that. Practical systems. Recognize that you have to fertilize the environment or con context for any kind of solutions you develop, whether they're instructional or performance support or leadership development or new processes. Uh, recognize it's a hard job, it's not an easy job. Because not only do you have to be smart and communicate, you have to establish relationships and to get people to do things they might not want to do or to, or to tread on paths they may not have trod before. So yeah, I, I think that's, I think it's a great field, um, but I, it's not easy and you get some practice. Uh, why do you think that's a good field for you? Mark? Uh, I'm actually in the, the, the Coast Guard, um, oh, and I've been, Coast yeah, and uh, my, I, they're paid me to go to school to, and I'll go back and do the HPT, but I know I, all about this. Yeah, my, I, we, my, had, we had 150 Coasties throughout my entire career at State, so some of my closest relationships today are with Coasties, I mean, who were students of mine who were still friends. So, yeah, my, uh, my previous boss speaks very highly of you and was in your program uh, quite a few okay. years ago. Who's that? Uh, Matthew Chong. Oh, yeah. Lovely, 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 lovely. Yeah. Great. Great people. Yes. Oh, yeah. So that's good. Coast Guard knows about it. It'll be a little easier in the Coast Guard, but not easy. I remember when the Navy went to the Coast Guard. I was there to speak at some conference in... Williams something, William, near Williamsburg. Williamsburg, that's uh, Newport okay. Beach. No, no, where was the Coast Guard? I was uh, at York, Yorktown, Virginia. Yeah, I was at Yorktown to do to a conference or doing something at a conference. And I went and the Navy was there. They had just come to visit all the PT. They had, must have had 15 PT people working in, in Yorktown, Yorkville, whatever. Yep. And um, Oh, it was so interesting because they came and did a full court press and the Coast Guard loved it because the Navy coming to the Coast, you, you get this, of course, the Navy coming to the Coast Guard and saying, teach us how to be PT and how to do this. So they tried it for a while, but then they gave up. Yeah. The chasms between entities are just too, too large in the Navy. They, they couldn't do it. It wasn't happening. It wasn't going to happen. Very interesting. But you're Thank in a you. good, you're in a good spot. That's that's a great spot. Thank you. And thank you, you for the advice. Oh, sure. I once spent a week in uh, Petaluma, California, yeah, training Coast Guard people. And, you know, uh, Coast Guard was the first ones into synchronous training. I, they were all they're all trained teaching using synchronous technologies. This is 20 years ago. And it was just fascinating watching. Uh, the, 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 we have Coast Guard people at India, not like San Diego State. You have many more at San Diego State, I'm sure. Um, we so had, I did. Oh, we had a, tons and yeah. we had uh, three or four a year for 20 plus years. Yeah, it was yeah. great. Ours are Love one Petal to three Petal a year. Love Petal. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Have you been there, Mark? I have, and that's most likely where I will end up. Um, after oh, that. yeah. <laughs> oh, many, many of my students went on to Petaluma. It was great. Yep. Yeah. Uh, almost got burned down, um, you know, yeah. but. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Got dicey in there a bit. Same with near Ellen's house. Um, Kevin's 
jumped in with a question here. Kevin, you want to you want to ask it? Uh, talk to us. Talk to us. Where's Kevin? Right here. Hello. So, Kevin, tell tell Allison what you do first in the organization you work for, and then ask your question. Yeah, I I actually work in publishing. So I am the editorial assistant and the uh, director of continuing education for a dental research journal. Hmm. So I, I look at a lot of these things from kind of a different lens. <clears throat> so my question is, uh, with your experience, and I, I've seen the list of awards and things that, uh, that Kurt put up. So I'm, I'm wondering what your observed practical differences are between HPT, HRD, and IST. Oh God, I think I've written articles about that. Uh, do you want me to remember the details? No, um, just, I don't, I would, I, I'm, I'm more interested in, in how you see it currently yeah, and, and what I mean, the, I, the big pieces are. No, when I say I wrote articles, they were readable articles. They weren't, you know, difficult by any stretch, but I really struggled with those very same issues. Um, I would say ISD, conventionally, when you think about ISD, is about applying educational psychology, as Walt Dick would say, um, to building educational solutions. They could be online solutions. They could be classroom solutions. They ideally would be a combo of that, but okay. So it's that. And I believe in a heuristic approach, not so much a steps and bo boxes approach, but a heuristic approach. Um, mental guidelines so that you can make good decisions about what's needed and whatnot. And where the outputs from one phase enlighten the inputs for the next phase. Okay, so that's ISD. And it, it, if you can do that, and you really have lots and lots of heuristics in those very broad boxes, um, you're gonna be really good at it because you're gonna have a sense of how to build more emotion in and how to work in the affective domain and how to ask the right questions and analysis to figure out, and this will take me to HPT. Uh, human performance technology is just like ISD, but after you do the analysis, you broaden the possibilities of the ways that you will approach achieving your purposes. So you would be including leadership development, you'd be including selection, you'd be including incentives, you'd be including performance support, uh, relying, looking at things at the moment of need, right? Yeah. So ISD, Instructional Systems Development, that's what it stands for, Human Performance Technology, um, asking the right questions to enable you to use the right solutions, not ones that are necessarily owned by an education or a workplace learning organization. Uh, and then knitting those things together so that good things happen in organizations. HRD, oh my gosh. Well, H let's just say HRD is less appreciated than HPT and ISD. I mean, people don't like HRD. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes their human resources people. <laughs> God awful. Uh, I wrote an article and I'm going to ask you to take a look at it. Uh -huh. um, although I will tell a little story about it. It's an article that was in Training Magazine. And I wrote it, I think I wrote it with my friend Sandy Casada, who's an FSU grad. And she worked at IBM and then she worked at Eli Lilly and then she worked at Amico and then she worked at uh, Amtrak as the chief learning officer, way up there. And I worked with her at all those organizations. We had a marvelous time. We met as, as youngsters at, at IBM when I was on a board for IBM. And then she got getting promoted and promoted and promoted. That's a PhD in ISD because she was a smart, practical one. Anyway, so I was working for her at Amico and she, they had just made her the boss of the instructional design group and the organizational development group, okay? And so she said, Allison, come on in and help us with this thing. The, we're bringing the IDs and the ODs together. 
I thought, oh my God, this is a problem. This is difficult. And so, of course, I first had to talk to people in the different groups and I had to talk to Sandy and the people to whom she reported, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I did a workshop on analysis because that's where the area where I did my work that was relevant to both groups. So then mm-hmm. both groups could go in their direction and then maybe could work a little bit better because they'd have some shared language concepts, et cetera. And that's what the article is about. But the funny thing was when you talked to the OD people, they would say, we in OD, we only work with the people at the very top of the organization. I mean, they didn't say it this way, but what they were basically saying is the little people, the salespeople, the researchers, the truck drivers, <laughs> we let the instructional designers deal with those people. And of course, this was not going to work. This was just terrible. And the way, and most, what happened within a few months of that is that uh, most of the OD people lost their jobs. I mean, you have to do something. And what they were doing was um, facilitating meetings. They were doing. They would attach themselves to the hip of an executive, and then they would facilitate meetings for that executive, thereby al- allowing the executive to be lazy and not prepare the agenda. But then he or she didn't think about the agenda ahead, ahead of time. So, I mean, it was really maladaptive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what Sandy tried to do, and I think rather successfully, was to get both entities to use a similar analysis framework and then to work together in their solutions. Because I was uh, had several students who were at uh, one of the large banks. And these were a couple of these people were former students of mine who had majored in instructional design. Now they're doing OD type things. They're going out there and they're doing all... I said, how'd you even learn that? What do you even... They said, you know, you really do have to work in organizations to help people get along with each other, get a shared language, get a shared direction, get shared expectations. I mean, one of the, when I got into HPT, one of the things that that I found so powerful, more powerful than any education was clarity of expectations. Mm -hmm. People will try to do what is expected of them if you're clear about what is expected of them. So I I find in today's world that uh, shared language seems to be a problem. Yeah, is that Times today? Is it the New York Times? New York Times? Oh, gotta look it up. It's really interesting. They're going on about Latina versus Latinx versus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and how people at at how many issues this is. creating not just in the world of diversity, equity, and inclusion, where of course it does create issues, but way beyond the professionals in those areas. I mean, people want to use language that's respectful and inclusive and smart, contemporary. Who wants to look like an old fogey when you, you know, in your language? Right. Not even I want to look like that. So yeah. So look, take a look at the New York Times. I'm sure that I, that it's it's either in there. Like I read, might be in the Washington Post. Post. Well, you have a fo- you had a follow up, Kevin. Go go ahead. Well, just on the shared language, I, I find that an interesting piece, and it sounds like you are saying that uh, within an organization. You know, between any of the three of those, plus all the other divisions, that, that there should be a strong shared language uh, within oh the, the corporation. Yeah, shared language. Of course, HRD usually is the senior umbrella under which you'll find, you know, HPT professionals, instructional design professionals, but you should also find organizational development professionals, process engineers, data people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like some of the craziest things I've seen is when our students would graduate and one or another would go to, the younger ones would go to work in web-based training and the uh, slightly older ones, we always had students who were, you know, 40, 50, 60, uh, they'd go to work in instructor-led training. What? That is not, I mean, we've got to have a palette. You know, there's got to, all those things have to be in our sandbox. 
you can't say I'm only instructor led. Damn it. Well, I am. I mean, um, say that, but nobody else can say that. Yeah, I, my master's is actually adult education. And so oh, the, the terms vary a little bit between them. And I have a hard time myself keeping track of, you know, in IST, what is this? And in adult ed, what is this? Because I vary a little know, bit. One of the best things, somebody, there was a question on the list, which is, how did you build the program at San Diego State? How'd that happen? And the reason we could build it is because there was none of that adult ed stuff going on. <laughs> None of that Malcolm Knowles stuff going on. <laughs> learning theory is learning theory. It's no right. different. If you've got a kid, the great things that help that kid or your puppy get smart are the same things that help an adult. I mean, different topics. Kids like dinosaurs, adults like cars, or some adults like cars. But yeah. It's been very interesting, to say the least. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, clarifications on everything. Oh, certainly, of course. <laughs> We've had two students jump in. I noticed Edward jump, uh, joined us. Um, I'm curious, and I know Rebecca's often a person, and, and Nelson as well, who has questions. Before I start asking my questions, Rebecca or Nelson or Melissa or any of, Sarah, anyone wanted to jump in with one more? Rebecca, it's yours. I usually have questions as people talk, but I could ask something. Um, I guess I'm still, so I'm, this is my first course um, in the IST program. And um, I think I'm having a hard time this week understanding how HPT fits into like educational technology. Like, cause that's the big umbrella, right? No. no. No, I mean, it depends. there are some places where that is the case. I okay. mean, you know, Hertz over there at AECT and that educational technology is a big old important umbrella. But, you know, I don't think that's a particularly useful umbrella. Um, okay. Don't get yourself all hung up over that, <laughs> those matters. Think about the kinds of audiences you want to serve, the kind of problems you want to address the kind of things you'd like to learn how to do, like, for example, analysis or evaluation and, account, you know, figuring out how things are going and how to improve them. Um, get excellent, if you like the performance technology thing, get excellent, again, then at analysis, and then at bringing multiple solutions together. That's tough, though. That's a, you're not going to get your first job, except maybe in the Coast Guard or one of the military. Seriously, it, as an HPT person, you're going to get your first job typically in instructional design. You're going to be building things, making things. Uh, you're going to be helping professors break their habits, <laughs> do new things, reach students better. Maybe you get lucky if you do a little work in metrics uh, measurement, you might get lucky and get some work in evaluation. I think that's just terrific area to go into. So, yeah. But you're, nobody's going to bring you in as the Uber binder and integrator of solutions because you're green. But if you're good, it'll go like a rocket. Okay. I mean, a rocket, really. Okay. And today, there's so many jobs, as I've told you before, in weeks 14 and 15 or the, modules 14 and 15, we're going to focus on the jobs and the competencies. We'll have uh, Jim Klein come in and talk about a, a study that he did um, next week, actually. And then I've done a study of uh, job postings in Twitter. And then we're going to do link, LinkedIn as well. And, and the jobs, as well as the, the variation of skills that are required, uh, are increasing. Um, this field, Allison, has to feel kind of good to see the field um, exploding in some ways. Uh, I I think the interest in the field is exploding. The market is delightful. Um, but I don't think academic programs have kept up. Right. Uh, and I don't think universities have recognized the field. I mean, they, they're going to continue hiring sociology professors rather than instructional technology professors. They can't deal with the application side. They can't deal with the integrated side. 
Right. Which it should be, which it should be. So eh, I don't know about that. Uh, but I, I feel good because I what I see is that people I know who are talented are doing just ridiculously well. Um, that's great. That's and, great. And, 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 and your relatives, your family are reading about our, the discipline in the newspaper. Uh, where they, 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 they weren't reading about it 30 or 40 years ago. Good point. But yeah. they're not necessarily reading good things. Let's be honest here. Because the whole problem during the pandemic with the shift to online. Uh, don't get me started. Um, you know, very, very grim. And I mean, we knew this was a problem back in the day. So... There's a lot of work to be done in that area. Well, uh, your, your friend Fred Sabo was a leader in the field and still is in some ways, um, your colleague there at San Diego State. Yes. And we all knew it was a problem and an issue, and he knew too. Um, but the problem is, is the terminology, emergency remote teaching is a horrible term to be using. It's a, it it's, a, it's It's automatically like, going to put a negative perception in, in everyone. Like transitional or transitory inflation. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Who's going to believe any of that? So as you talk about universities, San Diego State is unique in the, well, they have San Jose State and San Francisco State also at ed tech programs, but San Diego State led the way in the California state system and, and across the U.S. to some degree. What made um, this, this beacon it's called San Diego State, be, be such a leader in the field for such a long time. What, what, what got people to come there as faculty and as students? Was it just the fact that there's many military uh, bases in the state of California? Or was it no. something else? No, I think that we had a, um, we had an interest, we had our, you know, instructional design folks, and then we had some really good technology and media people. And we worked together. Right. In most graduate program, not perfectly, of course, but we did. <laughs> and our students benefited from that. So we didn't make them come in and say, are you Allison's student or are you Bernie Dodge's student? student? And you right. know how that goes in most places. Uh, I'm sick, stuck, um, I have post-nasal drips. Um, so one thing was we had a strong design and a strong technology component up to date and can we were super up to date. Um, and, our, and we were devoted to the teaching and we were dev really devoted to the teaching. Um, I mean, we would, we actually, I remember people would come visit our program. This is back in the day, it was pre online. And we actually put out, we had extensive syllabi and we would have a, a red notebook, a three ring spiral notebook. And people would come, faculty, other faculty from around the campus and pr uh, uh, prospective students would come in and look at the notebook because you could actually see the courses with the syllabus. This was so radical. And we would have, me I know it's hard for you all to believe, but <laughs> then we would, we would have meetings where we would brief our colleagues, you know, nine of us in the department or whatever it was, 10, eight, depending on the year, on our courses. So that if I was teaching blah, 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 and using this book, we would have, we had an instructional design library as a three or four books, and we all use those books, but different chapters. So that we actually, we, we had a program. Most programs are not programs, Kurt, you know this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was one thing. We had the strong media technology design piece. We actually had, a system and a program, we were very student focused. I think that our students would, would say that was true too. We were into it and into mm -hmm. them. Yeah, you know, we really, and we, we were bound to the community and we defined the community at large. So, you know, involved with Eli Lilly, we were involved, I was on a board for Eli Lilly. We had, you know, my colleague Bernie Dodge was the president of our computer using educators for the California state. I mean, we were very into the community. Um, I mean, we were so focused on the community. Um, and we were, oh, every, 
not the very beginning courses, but as we as students moved into the to the program, they did things that meant something to the children's hospital in San Diego and to, you know, uh, the publishing company in San Diego and to the zoo, 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 and so on. and So, forth. so I think that's what did it. And then some of us were good at marketing it. Yeah, very good at marketing. And Bernie's Bernie Dodge is a good friend. If you if you've heard of the Web Quest, Bernie Dodge is the father of the Web Quest, and uh, and San Diego State has spawned many novel and important initiatives in the field. Um, and which leads me to the previous question I would have asked you, which is, how does one move from English literature as an undergraduate <laughs> into the field of this is what your website calls it, instructional design and ancient technology at UMass Amherst. I don't know <laughs> who would study, is that a typo? Is it really called instructional design and ancient technology? No, no, I was kidding around. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, uh, all right. There so, were you know, no, okay. I mean, there you know, right no. now at Indiana, I'd say probably of our international students, probably a third of them come with an English lit background. So it's, it's because they can pass the GREs and the, and the TOEFL. Yeah. Of course, I, I can see why that would be. We had many students from abroad as well. Um, well, first of all, yeah, no, I actually can answer that question. I always, I loved literature, but what I liked best was the storytelling and the themes. And I mean, to this day, I, I read like a maniac um all the time so what i wanted was themes and stories uh the challenge of of creating writing packages or word packages that were purposeful and that were contemporary and that's kind of how it happened for me now i didn't no, it's not like I figured out, oh, look at this field. This is a good field for me. No, no, no. It kind of just happened. I, oh, I went, I went to a, a conference once and I saw Dave Merrill giving a speech. Really? Okay. Mm. He's been a guest in this class. Okay. So I went to see Dave Merrill speak. I was by this point nearly graduated. UMass was you're really a big nothing in, in this field. And so my education was pretty much a big nothing in the field, my graduate education. You know, later I tried to figure things out a little more, but anyway, I went and heard Dave Merrill and I thought to myself, what the hell is he saying? I have no idea what this guy is saying. <laughs> How am I gonna go be an assistant professor? And I don't know what Dave Merrill. So I, I realized I maybe had to do a little study to compensate, to get into some compensatory education. So, but it was what I wanted was contemporary stories, characters, themes, purpose in a contemporary medium, like that. I did, but I only know that now as I think back on it. It's not like I went out and looked for a graduate program because I never would have wound up where I was if I had known what I was looking for. When I say we had David Merrill in this class, 2007, I brought him in through Adobe Connect Breeze, and my students hated David Merrill. We read his articles about first principles. We discussed them in first <laughs> notes or something, like first class. They hated him. And then we brought him in live. They agreed with everything he had to say. You know, it's asynchronous Ooh. first, then synchronous. And I brought him in three years ago. He came to uh, Kansas City, AECT. And we um, had a, a Zoom discussion with him live that we broadcast in, in, in YouTube. And we, we made a, so I've had him in twice, not that this semester, but I've had him in twice in this, this class. And he's an interesting person. I don't agree with everything he has to say, I'm sure, you know, but he at least pushes people's thinking a bit. I noticed they, uh, that, that Nelson put his camera, I'm assuming Nelson has a question for you. Nelson, would you like to jump in? I can't see Nelson because of the live transcript here. Wait, let me get rid of the live. Aha, okay. Yes. Worth seeing there. Yep, I'm also from Los Angeles, so I agree with you. San Diego is the spot to be. A lot of beautiful beaches, a lot of great food out there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like Tory Pines. As a New Yorker, I appreciate ah. San Diego, but I love New York. <laughs> 
Um, you were speaking about the program over there in San Diego, and you said that one of the best things is that it was student focused. And I was just kind of wondering what it means for the program to be student focused. So I can analyze if my program is student focused over here. <laughs> I, you know, my guess is you probably know. I don't know how how well how far you are into it or not. Um, so what's student student focused? I think that we had many faculty, not all, but many faculty who were genuinely measured themselves with how well their students were doing, how well their students were thriving. Um, who took an interest in in the student, really watched and measured the students' progress. We had a very, uh, eventually, a very online uh, portfolio system and who actually looked at it with them. How are you doing? What are you producing? What are you creating? What experiences are you getting? You guys, are you all physical? You're not all physically. Are you all physically in Bloomington? No, I, no, they're not. They're not. No, no. A couple of them are, and most of them are not in Bloomington. Oh, okay. I, um, would you all text in where, where, where you no. are? In the chat window, why don't you type in what city you're in? Yeah. That will help. Many are from Indiana, just not Bloomington. Indianapolis, Naples. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Others prefer not to tell me. <laughs> Maryland. Oh, yeah. I've done lots of work in Maryland. I used to do tons of work with the National Security Agency. Well, I've uh, been there too, and they they screen everything in your body to make sure before you go in. They they took it, my flash memory stick, my my laptop. You know. Yes, Kurt. I went spent fifteen years going there. I I got so never even didn't even notice it when they followed me to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Follow you to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would teach a class, and they would have a stanchion with a broadcasting light on it out in the hall broadcasting light basically telling the universe there's an uncleared human in this room uh -huh. i was the uncleared human <laughs> um, and clark and i were doing a lot of work for them together and at the same time and yeah uh, uh, and uh <laughs> i probably shouldn't tell this well, i'm going to tell it anyway she could care less i'm sure uh, i said no i don't want to i don't want to get a top secret clearance. I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't care. And I thought it might get messy. But my, but Ruth said she's going to do it. And so she applied. It's an expensive and big process. And she went through this big expensive process. And then she flunked. Ha! But then she passed. Then she passed. <laughs> but we had endless uh, uh, hysterical dinners discussing how come Ruth Pet flunked. I probably would have flunked too, but you know. Anyway, she did pass. She's fine. She's good and clean. Very good. So uh, now, where else? What? What else? That's it. I think that's all I had to say about how I went from English literature to. Oh, that was about the. the I think that's all I have to say about student focus. Somebody cares about you. Somebody yeah. helps you customize and tailor your program. I mean, and is genuinely interested in you. Not so just so that you can uh, go to the library for them or whatever, I guess we don't do that anymore, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I definitely feel that uh, Professor Elizabeth Bowling and Dr. Bonk do a really good job of that. So thank you, Dr. Bonk for that. And shout out Elizabeth Bowling for that as well. Well, we've been yeah. here the longest. We came together, actually. We're a package. <laughs> we're no, we're, well, we're, but yeah, she came from Apple. I, I also came from industry. Uh, my previous job, I was an accountant. Um, so we both came from uh, 1992 when the building opened, both of us came and we're still left. Yeah. Uh, Allison, you know Elizabeth Bowling or not? I don't. I know the name, but I don't know her. No. Mm -mm. She's a graphics, a, a, a fine arts yes, person. Yes, that I knew. Yeah. That I knew. But I don't know her. So thank you, Nelson. Um, I've noticed, and just an apology here, that my system has frozen. So I cannot see what's in the chat. Whatever you type in the chat, I will not be able to see. I'm not gonna unfreeze it because that means I'll disconnect this whole thing for whatever reason. Um, so I'm gonna leave it run and then and we'll just cut off at the end. Um, so I have a, a, several questions that you can help people understand what things are. And I've sent this to you ahead of time. And I'd like for you to tell us three things 
I'd like for you to tell my students what the e-learning guild is and why it's important that they might consider attending the conference or joining as a member and what they have available to them. That's the first of three. Maybe I'll stop. I'll just stop with one. I'll do them one at a time. What does I, I've presented the e-learning guild. I know what it is. I've been a member in the past. I'm not a member now. Um, how big is it? Um, why was it created? Uh, what's the history of it? And why might they want to be involved in it? I think for, for students, e-learning guild is a great choice because the truth is places that want to employ you, want you to be up to date in the newest software packages, the newest language, but mostly the newest software packages. They want you to be able to, whatever's happening right now, and I certainly don't know what it is. I used to, but I don't know. Um, they want you to be able to, to use it, or at the very least, to look at examples of it and see if it's been well used. Um, so I think the Guild is a, it's, it's not, it's not advanced. You know, I, I don't think it's, it's not, but they do papers and studies on things that are very interesting. Uh, for example, they'll look at the issue of, are we evaluating e-learning? You know, how do we evaluate e-learning? They've got some very good people. Jane Bozarth is working with them. Um, I just think they do a good job. Really good place. If you had one place to go um, to, to join and to attend some conferences, you know why? Because what you don't see enough in school is examples. That's one of the things. You asked what we did well. We, we made sure, because we had such a strong technology component, we brought tons of examples in. Right, designs. We brought designs in. We brought e-learning in. We brought every kind of whatever stupid technologies going on. We brought some of them. Yeah, I mean, we had six screen crap, and it would break every time we used it. It would break. We would build examples. We oh, Brock Allen built a hysterical one on something, the killer tomato for um, Jack in the Box, uh -huh. slicing safe slicing of the killer tomato. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. But, you know, the students learn so much. So then we would bring in a bunch of examples of safety training. You can learn so much. That's what you should ask for your professors. Bring in more examples. So. You know, I have a book once and they just kept saying, give us some examples. I have a hundred activities book. It was, so I gave them all the publisher, all these examples. I, I turned it back and they said, we didn't expect you really to. We just, we just suggested, it wasn't really expected you would give us examples for every one of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways, what, what tell us, tell them what ISBI, the iterations of the previous, uh, previous titles or what, what was it? In, in it used to be the National Society for Performance and Instruction. Then it was the National Society for Performance Improvement. Right. Then it was the International Society for Performance Improvement. I think there it stays. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was on the board for many years. I think it was, well, it doesn't matter what I was, but anyway, ISPI is for human, is, is performance improvements, human performance technology. It's a, it's a good place to go. I strong, I love the organization. For me, who was trying, remember, I had to do, have to get myself a compensatory education. Well, I had to get a compensatory education in instructional design. And then I had to get a compensatory education in human performance improvement, even before there was any human performance improvement. So we sort of had to figure it out. Uh, I literally can remember sitting in a meeting in Bloomington, Indiana, uh -huh. at Diane Dormant's house. Oh, Diane, okay. Okay, because she was on the board with me, and Mark mm -hmm. Rosenberg was there, and uh, I can't remember who else. Oh, uh, Tiagi. Well, and I'm going to try and get him next semester, actually, Tiagi. Oh, um, spectacular, yeah. Tiagi, yeah. Spectacular. He cooked dinner for me once. Oh, no. One of my favorite nights. Yeah, it was great. Any uh, students watching this, go to T-H-I-A-G-I, Tiagi.com, and then you understand why we say, oh, God. Um, he's amazing. He's amazing. He's a magician. T H I A G I dot com. And I can't type in the chat window because I have no chat window. Okay. 
Um, so I've lost, I can't even, there's stuff coming on my screen I can't even take care of. So we're going to try and get well, through this interview. Yeah. So um, about that. he's 180 years old, but he's still going. You know, his parents wanted to be a, a engineer, but he wanted to be a magician. And um, G, isn't it Y? You think it's I? T H I A G I. Oh, yeah, dot com. Yep. Okay. There we go. Oh no! Wait. Silva Salam. Don't want. That's his first name. Tijarajaran is his last name. That's why he goes by Tiagi. <laughs> Silva Salam Tiagarajan. Yeah, he okay. creates one new game a day. He's that smart. Okay, the guy's brilliant. He lives a couple miles from my house. So quite um, a great, great. Yeah, very, very nice. Very good. Very nice. So at the third part of the trilogy, Allison is chief learning officer can you tell um, the students yeah, what yeah. chief learning officer is yeah. um, now my subscription has la lapsed so i need to restart it but i was an early subscriber yeah. um i've never been to the conference so can, you can inform me about this too so tell everyone what clo is clo is for clos and for clo aspirants chief learning officers and chief learning officer aspirants i sat at the table in san diego with who else who was it me and john taggart and one or two other people when they were going to create chief learning officer uh -huh. and they did and they were such good business people i mean i would never know how to do i mean i kind of knew what the content should be but i didn't really although not all of it i mean i've never been anybody's chief learning officer right that wouldn't be what you would want me for um so Chief learning officer is just as I said, it's about the skills involved when you put the world of learning, results, evaluation, emerging technologies, strategic thinking, leadership, consulting, because you're not going to be a chief learning officer if you're not consulting in your organization to enable the different lines of business to achieve their results. So that's kind of. So, so, so if C, so CLO, here's the difference. CLO wants executives to come to the conference. They want CLOs to come and high level managers in our world to come. So they have it in really good places, in really good hotels. Well, we're in a good hotel here in Chicago. I will say the Palmer House is a really incredible oh, place. Nice. It's very nice. Places. I'm sure CLO is held in better places, but CLO provides best practices. They celebrate successes very well. If you you can get it free, you can get CLO magazine for free. And so That's I recommend everybody, you should subscribe. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. They have and eLearning Guild has a free online magazine too. You should get that too. Absolutely. You should get every single one of them for free. Why not? What's eLearning Guild's called? It's learning solutions. The okay. the Oh, gosh, I used to publish in there all the time. What's there? They have a wonderful man, Bill, who's their editor in chief. Great guy. It's very, very. Yes. Um, E-Learning Guild, they have expensive that you things you pay for like there. But if you're a member, then you get many of those studies for free. And they do constant studies and write reasonably well-written reports. Right. CLO. Has a, has a good ma online magazine, again, free. And um, ISPI, probably not free. Not free. Coast Guard runs ISPI. Major, I bet they are a significant body of the energy that makes uh, ISPI go. Which again is International Society of Performance Improvement? Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. It's had various derivations of names over time. Uh, and so I want you to tell a story that is, is exciting for me to hear. And that's the story of Oxford with Jay Cross and, and Nancy Lewis and yourself. Can you tell the people what happened there and why that was interesting and worth, worth chatting about? Well, okay. I think it was exciting for Jay. And it was an exciting place to be. If I had, I, I should have brought 
some of the materials up. The Oxford English Union is the one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my life. It's a wonderful old building with uh, wood paneling everywhere. And it's just, it's insanely old and fancy. John Kennedy spoke there. Who else? Uh, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Martin was Martin Luther King there, I think. I mean, I think. really famous people come there and speak. But they also have this debate history there, <laughs> where people come and debate. And Jay Cross was in with the person who planned an event. So Jay got to frame the question. What the hell was that? It was some horrible question where he took the, the power positive side. It was really, it was, it was something like, you know, if you beat your, <laughs> if you beat your dog, uh, should you be punished? You know, that, you know, should they take your dog away from you? Right. So he made me and Nancy Lewis, Nancy Lewis was the uh, CLO at IBM and we were friends. They made me and Nancy Lewis go up against Jay and somebody else. But even though Nancy and I and some British in industry guy who was really very good, I mean, we worked hard on this, but it was undebatable. We couldn't win. And it's such a dramatic way of losing. So Jay and his partner, who had basically rigged the game. He rigged the game. Jay and his partner, did, we did our debate, right? We did our debate. And of course, Nancy and I, the whole time, are looking at each other and going, oh, God, this is never. And remember who's in the audience? The Brits. <coughs> the Brits were there. We had 250 Brits there. And the Brits, how do you even begin to describe? I'm gonna, no, I'm going to get into stereotyping, so I shouldn't do it. But the Brits, well, they were something else. The Brits, so we did our thing. And then they say, you get up and you walk through, they, the people in the audience walk through one or two, one or one of two doors. And, that, and they drop their card in it. And I think we lost, you know, I'm making it up now, but... 230 to 20 or something, or 210 to 40. Uh, and I'm just telling you, it wasn't our fault. He didn't write, it wasn't a good question. And of course, I, we fetched about the question from day one. You know, Nancy and I are going, this is not a reasonable question. Let's make it a little meatier. Let, nah, Jay liked that question. So that's the one we got. Anyway, it was really fun to go there with him. He was a super smart, interesting guy, even though he rigged the debate. And um, it was wonderful to be in Oxford and to, to visit the whole Oxford University campus. One of the thrills of my life, really, really one of the thrills of my life. I dressed up for this thing. I wore a long gown. I mean, we, we Nancy and I both dressed up. It was fabulous. Well, the reason I ask is Nancy has a chapter in my handbook, Blended Learning, and she called me to kind of confirm whether my book would be any good or not to, you know, kind of interviewed me about it. And after the interview, she submitted two chapters <laughs> instead of just one. So I think the interview of me went pretty well. Uh, and Jay Cross is an old friend. He passed away in 2015 during the AEC okay. conference, actually. Uh, in November or so, October, um, during during this exact conference, it's really, he was a close friend, um, and he coined the word e-learning. He, he well, one of many people who coined the word e-learning, but he did many things in the area of informal learning, uh, in particular, and corporate training in particular. He's a very smart person. Um, I've been to Oxford two times and Cambridge once, in the Cambridge Library and in the School of Ed at Oxford. Um, both were very interesting places. But my point there is, you never know where you could end up doing something interesting within this field. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of opportunities. And you, you know, to, I was just talking about being in Iceland, you know, and doing a three part skit um, with Ellen Wagner, I, I was talk, talking to her about it. Uh, and many places I've been to because of being in this field being growing that uh, everyone is interested in in uh, blended learning, they're interested in e-learning, they're interested in, in HPT. 
Um, and the, the right connection at the right time could, could provide a very interesting opportunity for any one, one of you. Uh, and Allison has had her fair share. I've had my fair share. And, uh, and Ellen Wagner, who's now the head of AECT temporarily, has, her, has had her fair share as well. So I wanted her to tell that story from the standpoint that, you know, these were, these were heavy hitter people in the field that, uh, especially Nancy Lewis, um, who, who I think has retired from IBM. I'm not sure Absolutely what- Absolutely retired. Yeah. Uh, living in Florida. I've, I meet her when I'm down there visiting my brother. Mm. And uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Say hi for me next time. <clears throat> Tell her I'm still doing stuff in blended learning here and there. <clears throat> Does anyone have a question before I jump into a few more? We just have a few minutes left. So I want to make sure you all get a chance. Um, uh, uh, go ahead, Edward. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, most <laughs> of the HPT professionals are in HR. Do you think that's the right location for them or should they be uh, more integrated uh, into? Because HR seems separated. I, I'm, I work in a tech company right now in Austin, and the learning is particularly knowledge management is a challenge because everyone's doing their own thing. And you know, are they really learning anything? But you know, if they had some kind of instructional program, people would learn quicker. Because especially the remote world. Now I'm coming to a job where my supervisor, even though she may live half an hour from the main buildings, hasn't been there for five years. So you know, we're counting on a lot of learning to be done, you know, on our own, but, you know, there's no really planned program of learning to adapt to a job quickly. And that's what I'm trying to do, incorporate that. I'm coming too from the military. So after 28 years in the military army, seeing the, some of the learning challenges and, but going through some of their schools, it's been a lot more organized than I've seen here in the, the corporate world. Yeah. I think that's a good question, and I, I appreciate your comments. Uh, yeah, I always would have preferred seeing learning people put in the sales organization or in the R&D organization or in the whatever, manufacturing organization or the IT organization. But that's, you know, it goes back and forth. In fact, I wrote an article about it, centralization versus decentralization in the learning organization. Moves goes back and forth with the times. There you go. I could give you reasons why it's it's good to be centralized, because then you can really develop your learning and performance professionals. You can um, make sure we you have standards. You can do more metrics. It's more it, you just have more communications going. The best among you influence the others. I mean, I think that's got a lot of possibilities. And then you're closer if you're really doing systems, human performance systems. Then you're better off because you're going to be closer to the OD people and the the re-engineering people and the web, whatever they, whatever it is you're up to, incentives, maybe selection. So that certainly in, in HRD, you'll have more incentives. The selection system is so critical. So that's the benefit about being centralized. But I think, you know, the ideal, ideal to me would be centralized, but with a um, hiring people and incentivizing people in our world for being absolutely focused on the area there they're serving like the finance organization or the manufacturing and they real they really work closely with those people and they are metric based on how those folks are doing so but your point's a really good one thank you ed uh anyone else want to jump in again we haven't heard from melissa and sarah yet or not uh, bishen um anyone anyone if you want to jump in Yeah, I had a question a bit earlier, um, quite a, a while earlier, Allison. I'm just, I was wondering if you could explain more when you were talking about your kind of change in education um, from literature, but you still got to kind of work with the themes and stories and word packages. Um, I found that yeah. very intriguing. I was wondering like, kind of what you meant and how you were able to, were able to do that. In, well, if you're going to be effective in the instructional programs you build, and if you're going to be effective in the ways you communicate, you're going to be able to tell stories. You're going to be able to talk about people. Uh, you, <laughs> you're, you're, um, I mean, some of the, but not too much. I mean, just enough 
to hook people and interest them and allow them to see themselves in that salesperson's dilemma or that safety challenge or that effort to create inclusive teams across the globe. Um, I mean, that. Well, let's say that's your goal. You're working on building inclusive teams across the globe. People are working on that all across in our world. If you're not doing that with themes and stories and characters and ramifications, things that happen, who's going to want to, what are you, who wants to read the policy? Who needs us for the policy? I mean, the policy has to be under there, but let that be something that, that you know, that they link to. Oh, there's the policy. Okay, good. Good. So, Allison, you've got several books that you, many books you've published. Is there any one that you want to pull out and say this is the one that's made the most impact, or this is the one that's still relevant that we want might want to get, or this is the one that needs to be built upon and and, and have a second version of it? Okay. This is the second version, or maybe the third. This one, first things fast. That's an analysis book. It's very practical, and it's still used and sells. And so that's a happy thing. Um, I guess my other favorite is the performance support book, Handbook of Job Aids and Performance Support. That's that's really chock a block full of examples, and yeah. and and it's even unbelievably as old as it is. It's still kind of contemporary in its technologies. So, and that's what people often refer to actually and use. Yeah. 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 So those two, I think. Um, yeah. That. So um, back to the article for week two. Since you had to, since you went and read it and reread it, right? Uh, right. And you're rereading of it. Uh, what um, what makes it relevant still today, if anything? Uh, what are the themes embedded in it that, that they might want to pick out from it? Um, you know, what what would you like to talk about from that article? Well. Um... I guess the most contemporary thing in that article, I looked at that article and I wrote it with a man named Ron Zemke, who was a wonderful, funny leader in our field. He was a writer, he was a thinker, he was a leader, died too young. I think he died in his late fifties, maybe cancer. Uh -huh. It was a, um, nobody write, wrote as well as Ron Zemke. Um, so getting to write with him was a, joy for me you know I learned things he was great um I so I looked at it and I thought um what is it about instructional design that's so wonderful you know and and I guess what I think is so wonderful about it is that it's it's about good things it's about purpose it's about clarity of purpose it's about bringing people together with different kinds of skills to try to achieve those purposes. It's about asking hard questions about why people do what they do and why they don't do what they do. I have to say, I haven't thought about this in a while, but I must admit, I kind of enjoyed revisiting it. <laughs> you know, it's about being both systematic and systemic. Look them up. Right. About both. Um, and it's about, I think, understanding the difference between algorithms and heuristics and inclining heuristically guidelines, rules of thumb that we keep in mind when we do this work. Um, so I guess that's what I said in there, isn't it? I thought Mark Rosenberg said, it's like the definition of democracy. Uh -huh. it, it's imperfect, but it's the best we've got, you know? Well, I appreciate you putting some people's names up uh, because they might not have heard of Mark Rosenberg and others that you have mentioned. So it's good it's that- Florida uh, too. All right. Naples, Florida. Many people end up there. Uh, my advisor. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. So in, in your later stages of your career, what topics, what trends did you see emerging and what things still appeal to you today uh, and you recommend that um, people look at and explore what areas do you see within yeah. the field 
that are emerging that are not just emerging in fads, but are emerging and important to look at? Well, I don't think it's all that different. Okay. Uh, it could be that I'm not as up to date as I used to be on technology. I mean, it's not just could be for sure. It's true. But it's I, hard. You, you leave this field for a month and you're behind in technology. So, you know. yeah. And, and so be it. You know, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but the basic question that we should always be talking about, and this is true in classrooms as well as online, and that is how to get the most out of that wonderful resource. And so I guess that to me is the basic question. So how to get the most out of those the, that and how to bring those resources together. So it's not just online and not just classroom, but bring them together, including coaching and mentoring. I did a lot of work in coaching and mentoring as uh, while I was in, mainly because when I would get involved in sales training for various companies, that's always was the answer. And when you really think about it for our students, it's, it's the answer too. good old, good old coaching and mentoring. Um, so what's, what else is big data? inclusion, AI, virtual reality. But really, it seems to me, the basic question remains, how to use the internet and our mobile devices and human resources in tasty bundles to help people learn to work better in groups, be kinder to each other, learn new products so that they can fix them or sell them, um, cage animals safely at the San Diego Zoo. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't matter what the topic is, really. You know, I worked in the Milwaukee County Zoo, which was the number two zoo to the San Diego Zoo when I was growing up. Um, so the Milwaukee was, Zoo? Yes, it really? was. Yes, for a long time is the number two. San Diego was number one. Because um, it okay. outdoor habitats, it was one of the first ones that, with outdoor habitats. You're right, habitats, right, 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 and that is exactly what's going on at the San Diego Zoo, which is many kinds of animals together, birds even, and you know you just got to put the right animals together so they don't eat each other. That's right. The same thing we try to do in companies and and universities. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well said, touche. Uh, I think that's a, a quote that we can almost end this broadcast on. Uh, but I can't end this broadcast because I have no functional control over my computer uh, at this point. It's recording. So what we're going to do? I'm going to just. I will turn my machine. Oh, we got a doggy here to end. Bring your dog up. Uh, we can we we can have the. Yep, we can have your uh, Labradoodle as the final guest. Now, my cockapoo is 33 pounds. Your Labradoodle is 28. So you would think a, a Labradoodle would be bigger than a cockapoo, but um, uh, is that Greedy? Or what's, what's his name? No. This is Roxy. Roxy, right, Roxy. Oh, it looks like Roxy. a Roxy. The Labradoodle, get down, Roxy. <laughs> I don't know. You may think 33 pounds is very little, but 28 pounds feels like a lot to me. <laughs> well, I'm let's right, just I'm say Oliver is hefty at 20, at 33. Oh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a big boy. He's slim and trim. Slim and trim. <laughs> we try to do five miles a day. Oh, walking five miles. Wow. Yeah. San Diego is where you can live and be fit. And that I will say it's the most fit city in the country. And then LA might be a little more fit, but I'm not uh, sure. But it's not as pretty. So the most fit and pretty city. Uh, so yeah, uh, I've lived in some places that are not so fit. Uh, so uh, any final comments or or uh, uh, a, a final just a final comment on today's session? Would someone like to offer the ending, you know, like uh, the last word for today? Melissa, you're usually good for the last word. Why don't you give us the last word? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Allison, for coming and speaking with us. I'm really inspired by your, the stories that you like to weave into your teaching and your, your work, because I'm very much into stories. I like finding relationships to things that I know and sharing that with others and helping them find relationship with that too. And I think that that's 
it's very enlightening to hear you talking about that too. So thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, um, so thank you, Allison. I, I, I think we start off on a bang, with a bang, with a lot of excitement, a lot of ideas in the air. And I, and I want to encourage my students to read as many articles as they can from this week, because it's not a heavy dose of HBT and corporate training articles in this course, in this introductory course. So read what you can. Um, Allison's available for questions. I'm sure if you want to send her a, an email or something, she would be you know, she'd be uh, answering those. Uh, and so, um, I, again, sure. thank her. For, what's that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to shut my computer off in a couple of seconds and I'll be sure, turning it back on. If anyone wants to come in in five minutes and chat with me about their blog posts and their questions, they we're going to have an ask me anything session for as long as you are. You can ask me any question after Allison is gone, um, but it'll be in five minutes. So it'll be 20 after seven in um, or 20 after eight in Indiana, 20 after seven here in Chicago. Um, and so I welcome you to come back if you don't want to, if you just want to you know, come back next week, that's fine too. Um, and again, let's give her a round of applause. And, uh, and I have no control no. of turning this off. So Allison, you want to say something before I turn this off? No. Okay. So thank you all for coming in and we'll see some of you in five minutes, some of you in a week. And Allison, you're so great. I'm going to ask you to come back soon, oh. sometime down the road. That was Let's excellent. So, all right. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody.